Eric, are you there? Yes, indeed. Okay, just a quick sound check. Thank you. Um, to everyone, welcome uh, to our webinar, Meeting the Challenge Head-On, Embroidering on Caps. My name is Alice Wolf, and I'm Madeira USA's Manager of Education and Publications. I'm joined here at Madeira USA headquarters by Nancy Minnie, who is our Senior Marketing Coordinator and Backing Specialist, as well as our resident embroiderer. Our special guest today is Eric Campbell, an award-winning commercial embroidery digitizer currently working with Black Duck Embroidery in Albuquerque, New Mexico. With 16 years of experience, Eric is a prolific writer for several magazines in the decorated apparel industry and a speaker who shares his knowledge at many trade shows and through social media. We're so pleased to have him here today. Eric, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, just quick little housekeeping. We are going to encourage everyone to please type in any questions that you might have. We'll answer as many as we can in real time, but we are collecting every question that comes in. Uh, between Eric and Nancy, we'll answer all of them and be emailing them to you. So every question that you submit will be answered, even if it's not on the air. Also, we will uh, record the webinar. It's already started. We are recording. Um, we will be emailing you a link to the recorded webinar so that you can view it again at your pleasure. And we'll also send you a link to a PDF version in case you'd like to print out the slides in order to have them by, by your machine. And with that, I'm going to ask Nancy to begin. Thank you, Alice. Um, so I'm Nancy. I've been here at Madeira uh, for quite some time and have actually been embroidering on some of the multi-head machines that we have here. I've been embroidering for close to 10 years now, and unfortunately, I hadn't even touched a cap, um, hadn't put the cap um, driver on the machines, hadn't even tried to hoop a cap. Um, so with this webinar coming up, I, I made it a chore to, to actually do that for myself, just so I could bring something to the webinar. And it was actually really interesting to learn it on my own. Um, so even though I've been embroidering for a while, caps is kind of a, a I guess, a, an element that I'm sure there's a lot of you out there as well have some hesitations for them. So with this webinar, what you're going to learn is you are going to learn what types of caps there are out there. Um, most importantly, I think, is the digitizing tips that Eric's going to um, share with you and let you know how to do things um, specifically for caps. Um, we're going to talk about the backings and which ones, how important they are to use and which ones are the best, and locations for the designs, and much more. So let's get going. Well, this is Eric, and here we start with the anatomy of the cap. Uh, Though you can see there's got a lot of different parts here, there are some that are more important to us than others. Certainly, you can see the bill and the underbill. These are areas that do get decorated, but those are generally decorated in a factory and a panel program and not decorated by us, certainly not embroidered. So what we're going to focus on the most right now is the crown, where all the panels come together. That's where our decoration is generally going to be. And inside the crown, one of the very important things I want us to notice is the buckram or the lining which is that the buckram is a stiff plastic mesh that's inside of structured hats, and it causes uh, quite a few problems for us, but it's something that we definitely have to deal with and think about. Um, you'll also see there the keyhole and the closure strap. The keyhole or the arch is another place where we do a lot of decoration over that keyhole, and sometimes we decorate on the strap. That's other things we're going to talk about later, but those are areas that we really want to focus on. Um, certainly, you can see the panels. You can see how the seams are put together, and we're going to talk a lot about seams, the center seam, what it does to your designs, and what we can do to help out with trouble with the center seam. So in the anatomy for a cap, I'd really like us to remember uh, the buckram and the lining, the center seam, that seam tape, the tape that covers the seams inside the hats, and the uh, crown and the way the crown is constructed. That's really what we're going to talk about here, and it has a lot to do with how your caps turn out. So here we have the styles of caps. Uh, certainly you have high and low profile caps, and profile really is talking about how tall the crown is. The higher profile cap, of course, has a taller crown. The low profile cap has a lower crown. That's going to determine a little bit of how much uh, vertical room we have to decorate on the hat. And it's not just the room, but how it performs. On a high profile hat, you can get better registration up into the higher areas of the cap before you start having distortion up into what I tend to call at the top of the front center seam, I call it the bubble. It's an area where that stiff center seam likes to pull the cap away from the needle plate when you're running. And 
the further you get into that, the more registration problems you have, the more flagging and motion you have. So between high and low profile caps, what you really want to focus on is your vertical space for decoration. Uh, and the difference between five and six panel caps, a five panel cap will have a smooth central panel across the front with no seam. Uh, those are generally high profile hats. Your classic trucker hat that people refer to is often a big five panel cap have a nice big flat front center area. Six panel cap will have a, a center seam right in the middle and that's one of those places where we have to deal with uh, issues with decorating both because of the thick buckram that's there and because of that seam being uh, in a central decoration location. And here are some other styles of caps. You can see flex fit hats. Uh, flex fit caps are a stretchy cap that has a solid uh, fabric backing in it, generally structured in the front of course so that they can have some body to the crown. Um, flex fit hats are great because not only do you have uh, the ability to decorate on the front as usual, you have a large panel in the back that if you can manage the stretch, you can decorate that area too and get quite a big logo or quite a, a lot of text back there. So flex fit hats are great for that, though they do cause some problems especially both because they have that super thick buckram and because they have that stretch. So it's really important as we talk about hooping later, um, it's great to have your hooping and your stabilizer dealt with properly for flex fit hats and you really need to if you're going to do a lot of decoration on them. Um, Eric, we're, sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, we've got so much material to cover. I know when we did our practice session, uh, we got through it all, but we're seeing a couple of people asking if you could just slow down a little bit. A couple of, <laughs> couple of breaths in between. There, everything that's in both. your head, they're trying to get in theirs, and we just need you to, to slow down just a tad, please. Okay, absolutely. And, Let me know if I run off at the mouth. <laughs> I get you. really excited about this stuff. So, um, it is cool stuff, Eric. I actually had a question um, to sure. throw it there. Um, throw it there for you. Um, would you say the buckram of today is a lot is is less dense or hard to get? Um, it's easier to get through today's buckram than it was say maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, I'd say it depends highly on the hat. In fact, one of the things I'd like to stress throughout this presentation is that you're going to find hats that run better for you, and you're going to have brands that run well either on your machine or the kind of designs or placements that you need to run. Um, write these down and sell these first. The first place you stop problems with hats is by having a hat that is constructed well, that has buckram that you can deal with, that st stitches well. There are some hats uh, that I've used where the uh, the buckram it was particularly uh, hard to get through, deflected the needles a lot, and where even single color designs looked terrible even though the, they stitched well on other hats. Um, avoiding those hats that are constantly trouble is important. There, there are so many styles from so many great vendors that it's, there's no need to um, use a terrible hat, I think. So manage your, manage your hats first, and a lot of these problems will go away. The problems that we're going to talk about in the digitizing section. Um, with that, I guess I'll go ahead and continue with military hats if that answers your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, good deal. Uh, military hats, as you can see in the bottom right there, they're a, a, certainly a low-profile hat. They don't have a lot of vertical space, so they decorate a bit like a visor. You don't have a lot of space from top to bottom there, but you do have horizontal space. The thing to watch out for with military hats, as you can see, is this horizontal seam that runs above the band. Um, some people will decorate across it. I have, but you will see that seam. It does cause some deflection, and it can be seen even under a dense fill with underlay. Uh, so many people decide to decorate above them. Other thing to look out for on a military hat, as we can see in the example, is you may have eyelets in the side placement area, so you're not, you're not able to do much in the way of uh, side decoration on a military hat. Um, Eric, do you find that hats. the material in, of a military hat is thinner than other caps? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And being that they're unstructured, uh, generally they do, they do act like other unstructured hats. They are thin. Um, but I think that when we talk about stabilizing later, you'll see that if you stabilize them correctly, if you have um, a good solid structural stabilizer, uh, and we're going to talk about the method for that later, you will find less trouble with your uh, military hats. Though they are certainly thinner. And in fact, I would say the same thing for structured and unstructured hats that we're going to get to in just a moment. Unstructured hats uh, sometimes don't take a very heavy decoration quite as well. It's super important that you stabilize them correctly and use the proper stabilizer. Um, but between stabilizing and using the proper digitizing methods to keep them smooth and to keep them married to that stabilizer so they have a little bit of structure while they run, I think that you don't have too much trouble. But definitely they are thinner. And of course because of the lack of the buckram, any unstructured cap is going to feel a little bit thinner, shift a little bit more because there's no buckram fused to it to hold that front panel together. 
Um, another odd cap we have there, we have the bucket hats, which I'll finish real quickly. Um, bucket hats, the one thing I want to say about them before we move on is that a lot of them have hardware, straps, eyelets in that front area. It's another chance for you to select a hat that doesn't have those things. Some people will want them, and you may decorate even on the brim, but those things are always going to show backing. So I'd say when you want to decorate the kind of a bucket hat, just select one like the one that's uh, presented there that doesn't have any hardware in the front. Now, we're going to talk about design considerations. And uh, one of those considerations certainly is mesh backs. We see more and more mesh backs with kind of the uh, flat brim snap back craze that's going on right now. Um, you can decorate over mesh. As you can see in the second example from the left on the bottom there, uh, I often decorate off the side panel onto the mesh, but it does have some deleterious effects on the edges of designs. Um, it will tear up the edges of your satin stitch somewhat. You need to have um, either embroidery supporting them like a fill, or the way I did this piece is to use structural underlay, almost like lace, where I had an edge walk underlay with a double zigzag under each of the feathers in that wing, and it held up and maintained the edge. Having that contour edge underlay is very important with the mesh backs. Also, remember you're going to see backing somewhat. You'll have to tear away very carefully and lightly, and you'll have to make, make sure you choose the right backing for that. The right uh, stabilizer is pretty important there, too. Mm -hmm. But you can run on mesh backs. It's just watch out for needle deflection and watch out for the, uh, the issue with the underlay. You do need something to support that embroidery that's there. And like small text stuff like that, I just suggest you don't do it unless you have something underneath it to support it, like a fill. Um, another thing, though it's not mesh backs, we talk about, sometimes you'll have a hat that people will call a mesh front. Over on the right-hand side, you see a magnified version of what is often called like an athletic mesh front crown. And what it is is just a textured material. As you can see on the edge there, um, if you have an edge walk underlay, it'll keep it from having that kind of rough sawtoothy edge that you'll see. That texture can cause a little bit of trouble, just like a heavily textured polo will with small text. So treat it like that. Even though we do the same things we need to do for caps as far as sequencing, um, th those mesh fronts will have some issue with texture. Eric, um, when it comes to the, the black mesh hat and the wings there, you're talking about the underlay. Um, yeah. Placement is, can often be a, like setting up the placement on your machine is not always an exact science. So does it hurt at all to have that underlay under the whole wing, even though um, it's only um, going to be... Um, no, I mean, I've done the same thing. In fact, um, one of the underlay methods that you can use when you have difficulty either with um, an open loose material whether it's a mesh or even with knits or with something with a nap um, is what I call a mesh a light mesh fill and that's where I'll take a tatami fill a regular seating stitch fill and go um, like a like maybe on a, a four millimeter spacing or two, two to three millimeter spacing I'll do a 45 degree fill in a shape that's underneath there and then a 135 degree fill so what you end up with looks like a little chain link fence and what that does is build a piece of, essentially a piece of material that's going to hold up all the stitches above it. Since the mesh has that kind of vertical grain that you can see in the picture, um, having those at the 45 and 135 at those angles, it really crosses those angles and makes for more stability. So you can do that. Though I would say with placement, though it isn't an exact science, um, when we're talking about digitizing for caps, it's really a good practice to get into when you're working with production to um, find a way to do your digitizing where you place uh, on a seam or on something that you can move from. You don't have to drop your needle directly in a seam, but since most uh, digitizing software will allow you, allow you to um, place the needle point for the start and the stop, it's great to put that on an easily marked reference point or something that's easy for your uh, production staff, if you have production staff that isn't yourself, um, to follow. Eric, um, question um, that just came in. Uh, if you were doing a long straight line, I assume a horizontal one, that was very close to the brim. Um, this person wrote in that when they did that, it became an arched line instead of a straight line. How would you avoid that? Um, in all honesty, you're going to have some movement. You're not, it's not going to be perfect right close to the brim like that. Um, certainly, the other thing you can do is measure and test. It sounds funny, but the it, digitizing is an art of distortion. If something's straight on screen, but it turns out curved on the cap, you can curve it in the digitizing process slightly to offset it or change your angle. And I would move a little bit away from the area if it's causing it because of some sort of deflection. Um, 
honestly, running really close to the brim is hard, and you will see some issues. Part of the problem there, too, is that hats aren't all made equally. It may not be that your line is that curved, but that you're fighting the curve of the bill, because it's not always going to follow the curve of the bill. Later on, I have a, a cap that we're going to show that went kind of wrong for me, and in that piece, one of the things that was wrong is that the curve of the bill was actually a cut curve that's cut into the crown, and that curve caused everything to look very crooked no matter what we did with it. So sometimes you'll find that the cap is going to have some of that effect on your designs and it won't follow or track exactly. Eric, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more um, question for you. What, okay. do you. what do you need to do if the cap is lightly wax coated? I'm assuming this is a sizing that's in the fabric that is in the manufacturer of the cap. You know, I haven't had any trouble with that previously, so I'll have to admit I don't like to say things that I don't know about, but it's something that we really haven't dealt with. I know uh, some materials that have had sizing we have trouble with, uh, we steam the crown before we start, uh, but a light wax coating specifically, I don't know that I've had an issue with that previously. I would think about either um, steaming it or even putting it through a heat press with a protective sheet to see if I could loosen that up, but honestly, I've never really had to run a cap with a light wax coating, so I apologize I don't have more information for you. Okay. Right now, cap frame limitations before we run on, because that's actually kind of a big one. Um, cap frame limitations, certainly we're just talking about size limitations of how much decoration area you have. But the big thing with, with design considerations isn't just cap frame limitations, but the uh, limitations of caps themselves. You have to remember you have a limited vertical area to decorate and a large horizontal area. So for designs that are narrow and tall, it's well worth thinking or talking about with your customer a redesign or designing something else that goes specifically for hats, um, using elements from their logo or something else to pull that out and have more space. Um, another a cap we're going to see later, I'll talk to you briefly about that, where sometimes adding text, pulling text out of a logo type, something else can give you more kind of bang for your buck since you can use that horizontal space. So remember, you're, the thing that's always going to limit your designs on a cap is your vertical area. Okay, now design locations. The first thing I'm going to say about the sample cap in the upper right hand, uh, we, in our, with a constructed cap, we're not going to be able to decorate like this. Um, that's one of the ones that comes from our vendors ready to decorate on the front panel, but they have this really great big side location. Um, people are going to bring that into you. You can do a lot of work on that side. Certainly you can see in the uh, third from the left piece that's on the bottom there, there's a fairly big side slash back panel logo that we put on for uh, Mud Volleyball there. And you can put a lot of decoration there, but you're not going to be able to decorate on the bill. When people bring that stuff in, just remind them that's something that has to be done at the factory before the hat's pieced together. Um, there are other ways to decorate, but not putting them on your embroidery machine. Now, certainly the front is the classic place to put it. Front, dead center on the seam, that is where a lot of designs are going to go. Even now, with all the great stuff that's out there in retail, a lot of people still go straight middle on the front. But remember that whole front area is totally open for design. Lots of people like to do a low right or low left placement, even when they have uh, like the couple of logos that are on the left there, a central kind of small or rounded logo, one small element, they'll still tend to put them off-center, down close to the bill pretty frequently these days. That's exactly what you're seeing over there in that DVD designs on the bottom right-hand corner. That's over all the way to that right seam, and you can see that we've gone completely off-center with it. That's really common. So the front is great, but you can go all the way across and even bridge uh, over into the side panel, just like you saw in the previous example with the mesh. Um, the side, same kind of thing. Uh, you, you've got a lot of area there, and if you can get it hooped correctly, it's great. You can have a really large logo there and even large multicolor designs. Um, certainly, it's hard to get into the sweatband sometimes, hard to get close to the edge, and decorating close to the edge like we see in this factory example is not always a great plan, but you can put a good large size logo there, and you can bridge over, and you'll find people going all the way over to the edge of the keyhole and decorating across the backs, especially when you talk, as we're going to see in a moment, uh, flex fits. Now here are some other classic locations for designs. Uh, the back strap, the closure strap, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, um, I always kind of caution people, especially when you're dealing like this strap where it's a hook and loop closure, um, don't put too much on there because with enough of a bobbin thread and stabilizer, you can cause the hook and loop not to close as well and not to catch as well. So I generally tend to keep that for small text and nothing much more than that. Um, the classic area to decorate on the back of the hat is certainly above the keyhole. But as you can see also in the bottom left-hand corner, not only do they have an above the keyhole decoration, they have one just to the right of the keyhole. 
Um, those are both really great areas to decorate, especially for the small logo. Like you see that football logo, that's a great place to put it centered in that area. Um, the great thing about above the keyhole, it's pretty easy to hoop to and you can flat hoop it, which we're going to show you later. Now, in the bottom center, that's the back of that DVD designs hat we just saw a moment ago. And that's a flex fit hat. And across that flex fit back, you can really use a lot of that space, almost the same as a cap front. The only thing to remember, um, it doesn't have structure, it does stretch, and it needs to stretch. So whatever design you put on there, make sure you allow for that stretch to be there. And uh, certainly you have to not only stabilize well, but when you're digitizing, um, sequence things closely together like your color changes don't move too far from left to right across there before you move to the next color in one area. Some we're going to talk about later because the registration is a little harder on the back of those flex fit hats. So working in one area before you move away is a great way to keep your registration and we'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Now this is almost a cautionary tale. <laughs> this is something that the people here at Midira pr produced and it's, uh, they showed me this thing and I essentially said um, this is where I turn to a customer and shake my head. Because all of this pretty much has to be done factory. Um, all the edging, all these things on the bill, the big stuff up into the crown. Certainly, I've flat hooped the top of a crown to put things there before, and I've hooped most of these areas. Certainly, you can do a lot of this stuff in the front panels. You can do the stuff in the back. But the edging, the bill, the rest of that, that's something that has to be done at the factory and done before it's put together. Um, certainly, these designs, these hats are going to come to you. The best thing you can do with this is show people what you can do and uh, give them some examples. Eric, a question's come in I've got about um, pricing and a person's wondering if you have to um, hoop twice for the back or the front and the side, is that going to be reflected in the price? I absolutely do. If I have to hoop twice, we, pr we price that as a separate location. We do price by location. Now with the 270 degree cap, you can often get your kind of front and side panels together. I find that sometimes it's enough trouble getting those things lined up that I still want to call, uh, charge somewhat by location. Um, but certainly when you're talking about the trouble you'd go to to hoop the back, to hoop your back strap, absolutely, uh, at least in our shop, we certainly do charge by location. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now here's where I get to do the walk of shame. These are my hats that went bad. So on the left hand side, the first thing I'm going to tell you about this one, this is one of those military hats that has that large horizontal seam going right across the crown. The first thing though, as I talked about those design limitations earlier, this customer came in with just that central bug that you can see on the right hand side, that logo that in the round, the Santa Fe wine and chili fiesta, that's all they had. And so when we first started, they were going to put that dead center in the front of this military hat. And um, we expanded and showed them the other option with that wide area, and they actually not only ordered that for the hats, they ordered twice as many hats, and they were much more popular than the previous year. So even though sometimes it's great to have an understated logo, for people who want that exposure and want a lot of information, think about redesigning for your short, wide spaces. Anyway, what went wrong with this hat, as you can see, there was a really heavy curve to the bill, and it turned out that that Sent that seam, that horizontal seam, is curved. It's not straight. So it was very hard to keep place correctly. It was hard to hoop correctly. And eventually on some of the hats, as you can see, the uh, logo that was just getting into the crown a little too much uh, dropped over the seam, and it certainly shows where it overlaps onto that seam. So this hat was rejected. And when you're dealing with military hats, bucket hats, and visors, you're going to find that you have to really control that vertical space. Now, the problem that I see most often when I'm talking to people with hats is the problem in this dead center here. Um, this Celtic not for a quarter Celtic pub, uh, it's absolutely out of registration. On that right-hand side, you can see how the green and the gray have come apart, and there's some of the cap showing through, and there's even a little bit of the green getting outside of the gray on that right. And what happened here is in the, uh, <laughs> in the pursuit of efficiency, I ran all the green first, and then all the gray. And all that movement, especially on the, the particularly difficult caps that we had to work with, um, was causing a lot of what we call rippling or waving, where it was pushing too much to one side or the other. And that was causing the registration to go out by the time I got back over to the right side with the gray. I would run all the green and then start in the left side with the gray. By the time we got to the right side, I was out of registration. So when I got to finish this piece, I ended up having to split it into four color changes where we had the green and then the gray on one side, and then the green and gray on the other side, 
that pulled it back into registration because I avoided all that excess movement. So keeping your sequencing right and staying in one area and getting it finished there, especially with the classic example is uh, lettering when you have a letter with an outline. Sometimes you have to outline each letter on a hat as you go across the, the uh, crown to keep it from coming out of registration. And the last example there, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. Um, at the top of that design with the little, uh, there's the silhouetted little equipment there, you can see that there's underlay stitching starting to pop out of the top. In that design, we had a lot of text to fit in and kind of a tall area. You can see that that eyelet is very close to the top of there. I've gotten too far into what I colloquially referred to as the bubble earlier, that curved area where you start to get to the top of the crown. And that area, because we're going on that curved surface, it tends not to ride very close to needle play, and it tends to wave and move a lot as you go into flag, which is hopping up and down. Um, because that happened, the underlay that I had to try and kind of bring that uh, dimension up, as you can see, I kind of carved that silhouette into pieces to get some dimension. That extra underlay popped out of the top as the hat moved over. So it's something you have to watch for when you're getting too close to the top of the crown. Um, when you get up to the top, Keep your underlay tight and far in and just watch that you're not getting too much movement. And if you can, keep away from that bubble area at the top center because it tends to cause a lot of movement. All right, so that's where we get to digitizing for caps. Most people have heard center out, bottom up. But there's a reason why we do that. Um, the where the attachment is to the brim of the hat is the most stable area right in that center. And what we're really working from is from the most stable area out to the least stable areas. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because if we have a good stabilizer hooped around our cap frame, um, as we work that way, we're attaching our cap crown to that stabilizer. And we're getting more and more stable as we move out. We're attaching it to that stable area, and we're tying it all into the frame, which we're going to talk more about when we talk about hooping. Um, also, what we avoid doing that is we avoid making ripples, because what can happen as you go one direction with a hat, as the, the uh, embroidery progresses, you'll see kind of a wave of material build up before the presser foot as you press toward it, if you can imagine the movement of the hat. Um, by going center out that way, what I like to call it is the tablecloth method of digitizing. It's like spreading a tablecloth over a table. You're taking that ripple and pushing it out toward the outside edge. If instead you have a design element that you've already stitched down and you have the crown attached to your stabilizer, if the next element goes toward that piece of the design, it's going to tie down that wave. The wave will essentially, quote unquote, crash against that already stabilized area that's tied to the stabilizer and you end up sealing that fold of that ripple down and sewing it in. So you want to keep spreading from that center out toward the top and that also keeps your stability um, continuing to, to attach as you go. It's also why we tend to do a small underlay, especially like say you have a big design that's filled. You do a small underlay that goes directly straight up, then it goes off to a 45 degree toward the top kind of corners of that cap frame and then out to the sides and back in. It looks kind of like a little tree or like half of a little snowflake. Sometimes you'll see an underlay like that in a cap design because what you're doing is preemptively sewing that cap crown down to the stabilizer to stabilize the cap frame or stabilize the uh, crown to the cap backing and to the frame so it rides close to the needle plate and stays stable. Uh, that also helps you to avoid flagging. Uh, once you've got yourself tied down to that stabilizer, the flagging, which is the cap crown moving up and down, uh, and popping up and down. Um, that helps to keep that a little tighter and to keep it smoother. Um, also working from the center out, it helps to maintain the registration, all because you're reducing that movement. Um, certainly, like I showed you with the quarter Celtic design, sometimes you have to split things into regions, like I said, left and right sides, or uh, outlining, outlining a letter before you move on to the next letter to keep yourself from having those registration problems, but you still want to work from the center out, out toward those edges. And that's what we mean by when we talk about adding color changes. Sometimes there's no way to run all of one color in another color. Very often you're going to have to stay in an area and finish things before you go. That's the same as avoiding that excess movement. You don't want to track all the way left, all the way right across the cap over and over again necessarily. Um, sometimes you'll be okay depending on the kind of movement you're doing. But if you're filling, you want to stay in an area, um, fill an area as you can, and uh, finish the detail in an area if you can. Um, provided that it doesn't uh, hurt the dimensionality or the layering of your design. So it's good to stay in that center, move to the outside edge. Eric, does it matter whether you move from the center to the right and then the center to the left, 
or the reversal? Uh, I've done both. I think it depends on the design. Some designs you'll find um, they have a heavier element on one side or the other, or they have an element that won't have as many um, registration errors and or registration difficulties, and maybe you'll move off to that element first and just finish it and then come over to where it's going to be difficult and do all of that stuff at once. And that can occasionally uh, save you a, a color change if it's the right uh, setup. It's hard to say without a graphical representation of that kind of logo, but uh, not always. The one thing, we're going to talk about um, script text a little bit later, and with that, sometimes you want to start over uh, to the left just because there's an opportunity to cover up a tail, and it's something that I'll, I'll show you guys later um, to keep the dimension looking right as if the uh, strokes were written left to right as we would expect it to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is the th this is actually a little nitpick of mine keeping script fonts properly sequenced. Um, usually you don't see a lot of trouble with this, but when you have like a really large, bold, single word on the front of the hat, um, on that left hand side you'll see that if you center out a cap design with some you know keyboard text, there'll be the tails of the lettering will stretch up onto the the letter over to the right of it. I dislike that look. If you look on the right hand side where you have the proper layering. That's what I tend to want to see, because I want it to look as if you've written those strokes from left to right. Um, it, it looks nice. It just presents a nice finished edge. Now, some people will use what I would call a butt joint, which is where you just take the, the flat end of the satin stitch and butt it up against the, uh, the angle of the satin that it's coming up to, so they're perpendicular. And when you do that, um, they look fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but you don't get the same look as having an actual overlap. And what I've done in center, and I, I'll just kind of briefly explain it, is when I ran the G then on, that's on the right side, that's actually run from right to left, even though it doesn't look like it is. What I did first is to run, as you can see in the center graphic, these small pieces of the overlapped area first. So I ran one, ran un, a traveling under the right stem of the G up to two, and I essentially covered the area where there would be overlap right to the point where the stem of the letter would kind of connect to the bowl of the G there, of that loop. And then I actually ran over to this point three and did the same thing for the I to the G. This is actually the word tiger, if you, you can't see it all. And I made sure that those overlaps were all where they would be underneath that loop. Then I went back and ran the loop, carefully attending to those seams with one and two. When I get to the edge of three, that point three you see there, at the bottom of that point three, those little blue sections are those overlap points, I jumped over to the eye and finished it. Now, I know it's a very finicky thing to do, but um, sometimes what we've won our entire contracts on quality alone, and one of the things I've had said many times, both with this and um, actually with big lettering jobs we've done, large uh, jacket back lettering jobs, is that I take a lot of care of my script fonts to make sure that the tails match and look correct. And that's something we've had comments on several times. So nitpicky, certainly, but it's something that I like to do on caps. So that's one way you can handle your um, script tails. Now 3D embroidery on caps. Uh, before I even start this topic, I always like to tell people this, this little phrase. If you ask three digitizers how to do 3D puff foam, you'll get five answers. <laughs> Invariably, there's different ways for this to work. So the stuff that I'm telling you now is not the only way. If you've seen another way or if you use another way and it works, that's fine. Because I would say um, embroidery, I like to treat it a little like science. You do some testing, you work on your variables and control them, and if the test comes out well and you can reproduce it, that's a good method. So before I share the method, trust me, there's other ways to do it, but this is my way. Um, certainly, I think satin stitches work best. You can use fills somewhat, um, but the satins, especially large, wide satins, like you can see in the bottom examples, um, those are going to give you some extra loft. You, got, you have a lot of room for the foam to puff. I mean, you do need to back down your tension sometimes a little bit, but certainly that's a matter of feel and testing, if you ask me, especially with 3D foam, since the foam can uh, act differently on different hats and in different uh, methods of application. But certainly you want big white satins look great in foam. There's other ways to do it, but I like to use big satins when I can. Um, you do have to create end caps where the stitches, it's not only that they don't cover the foam, it's that you need to cut that foam at the flat edges of uh, your satin stitches. Now in this example down here, you have a, what I call the cap and plank system I tend to use with really large letters. Um, and honestly, you have to cap all, all letters like this, no matter if they're small or large, you have to do something to cut that end. But the cap and plank is where you take this cap stitch that you can see in that bottom example. Um, you have a flush edge toward the open end of the 
satin, and I like to use a ragged edge on the other side so that you don't accidentally cut it and have any sort of texture or falling in of that top stitching. Some people will just use a satin that goes all the way across. I like to use a ragged edge. It breaks up those penetration points and lets the foam keep whole underneath the other side of the cap. Um, the other thing you'll see there are some corner points. I've actually used a couple of underlay stitches to cut those corner points out to make it tear away more cleanly. And then you'll see the plank. Um, what I call a plank is just a set of really long manual stitches that I put underneath the joints of the satin stitches. Sometimes you'll see on, on uh, 3D caps where the foam will cut and you'll have some foam poking out in, that, in those joints or you'll just have a very uh, distinct drop off of the height of the foam crown. And I'm, I'm saying crown here, I mean the, the height of the cap of the foam is as high as it sticks up away from the surface of the cap sometimes will drop at the intersections of uh, the satin stitches. And to avoid that, I will sometimes use a light uh, underlay, like I say, these long manual underlay stitches to create that plank that holds up that stitching and keeps the two pieces of foam together even after they try to cut. Um, the cap and plank system works pretty well for me, but other people use other, other ways to do it. Some people like to pre-cut their foam with um, edge walk underlay stitches that are really short. I've had bad luck with that in some cases where they start to try and pop out of the uh, top stitching if they're too close to the edge. I've had enough of that happen that I don't tend to use a lot of underlay. I use as little as possible and very long kind of zigzag walks across the column because I don't want to crush the foam down any more than I have to and I don't want any of that edge walk popping out. So instead, I just use this heavy stitch density, which is actually fairly common. Um, here we have 2 to 2.5. I've gone as far down as uh, 1.8. Uh, you can get really, really tight, but watch out for the stitches starting to build up and stack on each other. Every once in a while you'll have to kind of adjust how much density you have so you don't get any extra surface tension. If you want to have a smooth finish, you have to get just that right balance. 2.0 is a good place to start if you want to have a real tight, uh, dense look, but you don't want to have that kind of bubbling and stacking. Sometimes you'll see that where people have trouble with roughness. They, they assume it's a problem with the foam, and it's actually that they've gone a little too far trying to get that density to cut that foam down. So start start around that 2 to 2.5 region, and you can move back and forth. I Like I say always, I suggest testing as much as you can. That's really where, you're, where uh, everything is shown and where you can find out how your methods are going to work for you. Um, one other thing I'm going to point out in that bottom left hand example, there's a place where you don't have to have a cap. When you're coming down to a sharp point, sometimes you can just drop a couple of little underlay stitches to cut that point off and you just drop everything down to that sharper point like in the, the D and the C where there are breaks between what is it, you might not see that it's a DC, but the breaks that, that are between those strokes, that sharp point also will cut off and if you, uh, sometimes you may have to poke a little bit of the foam back in, usually it's pretty decent. Um, finishing foam, the other thing to remember, uh, heat Heat is great for finishing foam, but be careful, especially with light colored threads. Um, heat guns, hair dryers tend to work, and that's a good way to smooth that out. Okay, when you choose your foam, for your, you want to get really close to the uh, thread color as you can. It doesn't mean you have to carry a million colors of foam. It does mean kind of watch, especially kind of the tonal value. Sometimes you can use a gray for a lot of different colors. It just depends on uh, how light, how dark that is. You want to stay in the same kind of range so that you don't see as much of the foam. The thing that's the worst is a super dark thread with a really bright foam. Every little hair and every little bit of foam that sticks out shows terribly. Um, the underlay or outline stitches. In this case, what we're talking about is, as you can see, either in the Celtic Knot, which is a 3D foam version of that quarter Celtic design we showed you earlier, or behind this Superman logo, uh, that background fill or those outlines that you see in the gray there on the Celtic Knot, any flat elements you want to stitch before you place your 3D foam down, um, because trying to do any sort of elements around the 3D foam, your presser foot's going to crush into the foam, you're going to cause trouble, you don't want to do that. Um, even if you wanted to try and tear it away and run something else, I would suggest any flat elements you're going to put in there, put them down before you do your foam layer. Um, certainly, like you see here, those underlays, those outlines, all of those are placed before you lay down your foam. Eric, um, is, there always seems to be a, a there's been an ever long quest for the uh, stiffer foam, and it sounds like it. A lot of times, it really has more to do with the the digitizing itself as opposed to the foam. Um, because I think what happens is, or what sounds like what's happening is, they're just not getting enough loft when it comes to that 3D effect. Could you just focus a little bit more on that as far as the digitizing? Just kind of reiterate um, how that sure. in itself can help get the loft. Um. Sure. Uh, well, honestly, part of it's also design. 
A lot of people come to 3D foam with these very, very small details, though you can get a pretty fine line. I mean, the outside edge of this Superman logo we can see in the Batman symbol, those are pretty fine lines, but they're nice satin stitches. If you do really tight lines, and even when you do like the points, as you can see when something comes down to a point, it starts to sink the smaller that stitch gets. The larger, the wider your stitches, the longer length you have, the more loft you're going to get. So that's, that's important, certainly. You want to make sure that you have that long, those long stitches if you want the most kind of bang for your buck. The other thing to look for, um, if you have your machine tension too high, if you have it cramped down, try and back your top tension off a little bit. I mean, certainly you have to be careful and make sure you're not going to cause yourself trouble taking your tension too off, but sometimes you'll have your, uh, ten your machine tension too tight, and I think that that'll crush the foam too. And uh, working too much into the foam, I, I personally think that sometimes if you over underlay it, I've seen people run several rounds of underlay or even use two layers of single density satins to try and get that look on foam. I'm not a fan. I think the more you touch the foam, the more you crush the foam, the less it holds up. So when you're getting that loft, that's something you want to work on. And a lot of what's going on, I think people don't feel like they're getting the loft. It's uh, Some of it is also because they... Um, have worked on it too much in post as well. You know, they try and to try and get the little fringe and hairs and bits of foam that are sticking out off. They apply too much heat too long, or smash or rub it. Now, certainly a little bit of rubbing sometimes helps for poking corners in uh, with a pin or a tool will help things look cleaner. But sometimes you can overdo the pressing and such. So, I think that's another thing to work on. I personally, I just feel like the the more you can leave that foam alone, the better off you are. It's totally fine to use press cloths or to steam it, to work on it, to rub it a little bit, because sometimes rubbing it will loosen those stitches up and get them over those small fibers, like you can see in the example on this, this frame. But I think overworking the foam can sometimes make it worse. But as you can see, like this Call of Duty lettering, that's sticking up very much proud of the surface. That is, you're getting the full height of that foam on that, what I, like I'm saying, I kind of tend to call it a crown, the crown of the foam, the top of those satin stitches. It's really high and really crisp. Um, certainly this one could use a little heat and probably get cleaned up a bit more. But those wide satin stitches are your best bet for getting the big crown, and certainly you can go really wide on those. Eric, um, you mentioned that a couple times, the wide satin stitches. One of the questions that came in was, how wide can you actually go with a satin stitch? Well, I mean, your machine's going to limit some of that, because you get too much over 10 millimeters on most machines, like 12 millimeters, and they're going to start doing this double. They have to turn the hook twice before they drop down. It'll slow your machine to more than or less than half of the speed that you usually have, and I find that it runs a little rougher when it's doing that. I don't like to go that wide if I don't have to. I mean, sometimes you'll do it to get that look that you want, but I think if you're, if you're working in that kind of 10 millimeter wide satins, those are really great. They're going to puff up really large especially if you're working good foam, um, but you can go wider. It just just have to re realize you're going to slow your machine down. You may have a little bit of a rougher run, um, and you should charge accordingly. I mean, you're going to really slow the machine down. It's going to be like you have twice as many stitches yet again, despite the fact that you've already got twice as many for the density it takes to cut and cover. So um, you can go very wide, but remember also for your billing that it's going to slow you down. Also, on the Batman Superman logo, did you stitch both of those at the same time? With the I didn't stitch that logo. That's uh, That was another sample you guys provided. Um, so I, that one okay. I don't know, I'm afraid to say. Okay. But I have, I have run more than one color at a time, um, certainly. Uh, when you do that, a piece like that is a little harder because if you try and nest different colors of foam, but I, I'll just sometimes use a medium color that's between them. Like on that, I might have selected like a charcoal gray, a dark gray foam, or a whatever gray foam I could get that was in that kind of range because it wasn't going to, it won't contrast too highly with the black or the gray. So you can do it with one layer of foam if you want to do that. Um, I've done that before, though as you run foam, as you cut it, it will get a little looser, so you don't want to be too close multiple areas sometimes because you will find it is going to get looser as it cuts away if you're trying to use one piece of foam for multiple pieces on design. But I mean, even this lettering, of course, you're cutting all the way through all those different letters. It holds up just fine. And that's another good th thing about testing. Seriously, this is, I, I always tell people, if you really want to learn how something works, the best thing you can do, talk certainly talk to some people who have done it before, but test, especially when it's stuff that is fairly safe for your machine, it's something other, somebody else has done. Test it, watch it, write down your results, and you will absolutely advance your embroidery knowledge quicker than any other method, even listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, um, attaching the 3D foam, I don't think we touched on that. Um, so with a light um, embroidery-specific adhesive, um, would uh, that down, right? 
Um, I tend to like to use a light embroidery, like I said, embroidery specific always because you don't want to gum up your needles or have a bunch of uh, haze on your garment, but a little bit of spray adhesive is enough to do it. Some people will tape it down with painter's tape. Some people with single heads, I've watched them hold it down. I'm not a fan of that because I don't like people turning off their, uh, their sensors and running their fingers out of the machine. But uh, certainly just a light spritz will generally hold that stuff down. But it is a good idea to take a, a few long stitches and, and sew it down in the underlay before you get running anything heavy in the top stitching. Um, like I said, I don't like to crush the design by going too far into it, but some long underlay stitches that tack that down before you start running, it's certainly a good thing to do. Okay, now hooping caps. This is one of the harder things we do when we're talking about hooping and framing, and even for me, I find that it's slower than I want it to be every time. So don't feel bad if you ever had trouble hooping a hat, especially because different hats act differently, they're constructed differently. Um, we talk about you know, single location, multiple location. I think what we're really talking about there is if you have a hoop that is not a 270 degree hoop that is just for the front panels, um, then it's a little bit different how you're going to do your backing. But no matter how you do the backing, the one universal is you want that, that backing, which I'm going to call stabilizer here because I kind of don't like the word backing. We call it stabilizer because what we're using it for is to keep our, our area and our um, fabric stable because it's dimensionally stable and it adds structure. Uh, what I mean by dimensionally stable is you take a piece of fabric, even the crown of a hat, and you work it in your hands and stretch it different directions, you'll find that it stretches differently at different angles. It's not dimensionally stable. Backing stabilizer is. And what it's good for is keeping things from stretching and moving. So it's not backing, it's not like topping, it's not like sprinkles on your ice cream, it's something that's it's a stabilizer. It's something that is necessary to the, the best running that you can do on your machine. So with that in mind, with stabilizer, what you want it to do is to tie to the stable areas of your cap frame because when you start stitching your cap design, you're going to sew that cap crown to the stabilizer and that stabilizer, if it's well attached and well supported in all of the areas of the cap frame that it can touch, that's going to make more stability and it's going to transfer the stability of the frame to the hat. So when we're talking about like the 270 degree hoops, I like to have a pretty much a full ring of stabilizers you can see there. It makes this cylinder that is very stable, that has some structure to it, and that keeps the cap very smooth and provides a smooth back for, to slide around the uh, cylinder arm. So making that kind of hoop, that little hoop of backing, that hoop of stabilizer, helps to really keep that crown put together, especially if you've got that thing hooped very smooth across that stabilizer, when you start sewing it down, if you work from the center out like we talked about, you're going to be increasing that stability as you go around and you're going to be tied into, as you see the vertical bars that are at the back of that 270 degree hoop, um, and the teeth that are around the front edge, tying that stabilizer into that all the way around means that you've got some structure and it helps to lend that structure to your hat. And that's both for structured and unstructured hats, they both need backing. And in fact, sometimes I think the structured ones need it more because they tend to want to come away from the needle plate because of the curve that's in the top of the bill. And we, by sewing it down to that smooth cylinder of, of stabilizer, we can keep it closer to the needle plate and we can keep it a little more stable. So off my soapbox a little bit, but stabilizer is to keep things stable. You want to tie it into the hoop frame and you want to get it very um, structurally put together. That's why I like the full ring. Um, Eric, um, just wanted to point out the incorrect and the correct there. Um, I, prob <laughs> I probably spent, oh, probably half a day just getting the hoop um, driver, the cap driver in there, my hoop set up and hooping. And I actually felt pretty proud of myself to, um, that I actually was able to get a cap hooped um, and then did eventually um, embroider on it, only to find out my hooping wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Um, so as I, I was more than happy to leave that in there because I think I would imagine that's a, a common mistake that you might do um, and some of the questions that actually came in was how do you get you know to within an inch above that bill and my, I would imagine that by hooping it correctly um, you're going to be able to get further down. Um, um, certainly hooping it correctly will help I mean you need to make sure you got to get your sweatband out of the way I'm sure you probably did that part I but did. as you can see uh, <laughs> That little strap that goes above the bill, you can see it in the correct and in the wrong sides, and I hate to say that because I know that was your effort <laughs> at doing the caps. It's hard. It um, but as you can see, the, those, that little strap has teeth on the bottom edge. Those teeth are supposed to go in the seam above the, the brim, above the bill. 
So you want those to fit in that seam, especially with a flat build hat, it's, it makes it a little easier, but you know, you, you're going to have to kind of massage it in there. But once you do, you'll find that it holds it really tight. And you'll also find that on the hoop frame itself, there's a set of teeth that is on the inside that actually is offset a little bit from it that goes above that. And that's going to hold that seam really tight. And as you can see, look how smooth, how much smoother that the correct side is. Even though it's got a little bit of a bubble in it uh, on that hat, that's a hat that actually is unstructured, believe it or not. That's an unstructured hat. Um, so that having it solid in there and having that, um, that hoop of, uh, like I talked about, the hoop stabilizer really makes a difference. The other thing you'll, you'll see, and um, you can see kind of on the wrong side, I hate to say, mm -hmm. down toward the bottom, you see those little bright teeth that are on the bottom over toward the, the, the right-hand side toward the bottom of that strap. Those teeth are also supposed to be just above the seam. So what that does, the, the great thing for the 270 degree hat, hats, a lot of people tell me like, oh man, I try and do the front and the side placement at the same time, but the side placement's always crooked or off or tilted. That's supposed to help you with that. That helps you get the seam that's the bottom of that crown aligned all the way across. So if you, if you see those teeth, the teeth in the very front are supposed to go under that seam across the top. And then the teeth that are on the top of that ring, near that lever and on the other side, those are supposed to go just above the side seam that's at the edge of the cap crown. Um, if you have those placed, you're going to have a straighter look to it. It's going to hold a little tighter, and you're going to be able to get as close as you can get to the bottom of that crown. Now, the truth of the matter is, though, um, a lot of hoops, you're just not going to get right down there. Everybody brings in, and we have customers do this all the time, they bring in commercially done hats that were made before they were put together, and people are able to get all the way down to the edge of the brim. You're not going to be able to do that necessarily. I mean, within an inch is tough. Is tough. You can get within within that inch, but the half inch. The one thing I, I tell people to do is you measure the din the distance between your needle point and the furthest part back on your uh, presser foot, and you can see that sometimes there's almost a, depending on the machine, there may be a half inch there in the first place. You're going to be up against your crown no matter what you do. So even if the hoop wasn't in the way, which it usually is. Um, you can't get all the way down there. So sometimes there's just a matter of talking to your customers and explaining that the machine can't get all the way right up against the bill. Um, and that's just something where if they, honestly, I hate to say it like this since this is not what we do, we're decorators. I don't. I personally love to have control, creative control, but sometimes you tell them if they can get the minimums together that we have to order from a manufacturer who's going to put the cap together after it's decorated, they absolutely must have it either over the bill or all the way down to the edge. Most people, after you tell them that and show them where you can get, are pretty happy. But you're right, correct hooping will definitely help you get a little closer. Okay. All right, and then uh, the other example down there, real quick, I'll just tell you, that's a flat hoop of a back cap arch. That's all that is over the keyhole. It's easy to do on flat, and I think that sometimes that's the best way because then you get really good stability. You just uh, hoop that over top of the stabilizer and stitch, and it usually runs very well. Right. And so... Um, talking about that a little further, whenever you can hoop something, um, it's always best to hoop it. Um, oh, absolutely. The flat or the round cap frames, because that's going to give you the best stability. Oh, and I tell people this all the time. There's especially coming from a hobbyist location, a lot of people like to do what they call floating, where they float it above the top. That's what I would consider the last ditch attempt to get something embroidered. If you can hoop it, it's going to produce the most stability always. You are correct. Um, so here we are talking about cap backings, and very aptly, um, Eric has told us that those are actually stabilizers. And you know that is there are two common names that are out there, but stabilizer is what they do. Um, of course, it does go on the back of the um, whatever garment you're doing, so it is needed. You're always going to need it. Um, when it comes to cap backings, they are special in a couple of ways, and it's basically the thickness of them or the weight, as they're sometimes um, measured in how thick they are. Um, so two and a half ounce, three ounce is usually the weight, and these are tearaway back. And so, you know, when it comes to embroidering on your general um, apparels and, and whatnots, anything other than caps, you don't usually need a two and a half ounce or three ounce tearaway backing. Um, tearaway backings are stabilizers for the embroidery process. Um, so these are um, specially made for that in that they're cut 
to a four or four and a half inch width. They come in pre-cut, so sometimes you can get that seven inch, seven and a half inch, um, going up to a 12 inch pre-cut, um, but probably ideally are those rolls, so you can cut it to the size that you actually need. Um, and one of those pictures we showed in the hoop, you can see that backing went around that whole hoop, um, gave it real great stability around the whole hat, keeping it nice and round, um, and supplying the stability that it needs. Um, so be careful of um, getting backings, cap backings that are less than four inches because you might not be getting as much um, coverage as you could really use when it comes to hooping the caps. Um, so keep those backings slash stabilizers um, ready and available when it comes to hooping caps. Um, many questions came in throughout the webinar about needles, and we knew this page was coming up, so we're going to be able to help you out there. Um, when it comes to needles um, on caps themselves, you always want to make sure you're using a sharp point needle. And when it comes to the size of a needle, um, 75.11, 65.9, up to an 80.12, that actually depends on the thread, the thread type that you're using. The bigger the needle, the bigger the eye, um, so the thicker the thread, you know, you want a little bit larger of an eye. If you're going down to a thin thread like that polyneon 60 we have there, you're going to go to a smaller needle. Um, very often when it comes to threads and manufacturers, they're going to give you um, a choice of two needles. And the reason why that is is because um, very often um, the larger needle is going to give you less trouble. With the more experience you get with embroidery, any type of embroidery, um, if you're able to go down a size needle, um, when it comes to the designs and the clarity that you're going to get, um, the smaller the needle, the better. Um, so keep in mind you want to slow that machine down. We talked about that. I have 650 to 700 stitches a minute. Um, our machines nowadays um, go way above 11, uh, 1,000 stitches a minute, which is pretty quick. Um, 1,100, 1,200, and even more than that, um, stitches per minute going pretty fast. Just because a machine can run that fast doesn't mean you always have to run it that fast. Um, even for your regular design, slowing um, the machine down, you can get a better result. Not only are you going to have less thread breaks, um, needle breaks, the designs themselves are actually going to look better. Um, when you're talking about um, embroidering on caps, you get that flagging that Eric talked about um, earlier. And flagging is when the hat itself, or the crown of the hat, bounces up and down as you're embroidering. When you first start out, embroidering um, a cap, go ahead and hold the start button so you get that slow start that most machines are going to give you. Uh, once you can see it's actually caught on and it's um, on its way, you can go ahead and let it go and stitch out at the regular speed. And that's going to help you out. Um, it helps um, reduce the needle deflection because that's a lot of times that's where you're going to get that needle break. When it comes to threads, polyester threads are really the way to go when it comes to caps. They are a little bit stronger. Um, you might have a little less trouble with them, but not only that, caps are worn on the head and they're exposed to sun on a regular basis, so polyester threads aren't going to fade. And that's true for the frosted matte thread, um, which is also a polyester thread as well. Notice in the poly neon we have the 40 weight, which is a standard weight thread. Um, everybody's used to that 40 weight thread. Consider going down to the 60 weight thread, and I say go down because 60 weight is a thinner thread. Um, with that thinner thread, you're going to be able to get your real small letters in there, um, get some more fine detail. Um, using the black and the 68 for your outlines can give you some real great clarity. Um, and don't shy away from metallic threads when it comes to caps. I, when I think of metallic threads, I always try to encourage people to, um, sometimes less is more when it comes to metallics. Um, by just using a little bit, you can gain you know, quite a bit of um, effect on it. Eric, now we know why you spoke so quickly, and Nancy, I'm looking at my watch and it just struck the hour. Um, we have seen a lot of questions come in, um, and the very last one was asking if this webinar um, is available to watch um, afterwards, after we end, and yes it is. Um, I'd like to thank both Eric and Nancy. Uh, that was a tremendous amount of information packed into an hour. Um, Eric, thank you so much for spending this time with us and, and sharing all of your knowledge um, with everybody that attended today. Um, and everyone, to thank you for your time. Uh, you'll see here we have a special 10% savings. If you would like to try out our Easy Cap backing, um, if it's included with an order, you would receive 10% off the entire order. 
Um, also, you'll see contact information here for Eric. One of the questions that came in at the very beginning was, I would love to follow Eric on his blog. Um, you'll see that he has a website. Um, he does, he produces a podcast. There are, if you are socially inclined, there are many ways to uh, contact Eric and to be informed by him on a regular basis. We also have a blog um, called MadeiraMatters.net. All of these contact information will be sent to you by um, email. Um, so you have the contact information here. You have the special information here. You will um, also be getting uh, questions and answers to every answer and question that came through. We will be e emailing you a link to a recorded version of the webinar as well as a link to a PDF version in case you'd like to print out the slides that you saw today. Uh, thank you so much. We, we kept it to an hour, which was difficult because of the amount of information that we shared. Again, uh, thank you to Eric and to Nancy. Thank you so much um, to everyone for spending this time with us. Don't hesitate to get in touch with Madeira USA or Eric Campbell for answers to your embroidery questions. Thank you.